living the rays and joining the Eternal Doctrine of Scott. My name is Brandon Sweeney, and I am here to introduce the speaker this evening, who, by the way, is my brother. Sean P. Sealy has been actively working in the field of financial services for over 31 years, specializing in key areas of financial planning, namely life insurance planning, long term planning, retirement planning, business insurance planning, and estate planning. Mr. Sealy has worked with a number of the most respected financial institutes in the financial services world. Prudential, New York Life, Carnegie Life, Northwestern Mutual, and Alliance Life, to name a few. In 1995, Mr. Sealy started the Sean P. Sealy Financial Group, incorporating his vast knowledge of insurance and retirement planning with an educated the public for understanding the need for estate planning. For estate planning purposes, the SPS Financial Group has aligned itself with two organizations dedicated to the field of estate planning. Those organizations being the National Institute of Certified Estate Planning and the APPS Institute for Wealth Preservation. The SPS Financial Group is committed to changing the perception of estate planning, particularly in the black community, and to make it a bigger and more permanent part of our culture. Educating the public is the only way this can be done. This is Sean Sealy's life mission, commitment, and passion. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you my dad, Mr. Sean P. Sealy. Secondly, I would like to express my appreciation uh, for you having the insight and understanding the importance of an education of this type, knowing that the vast majority of us have no idea that we have a need for a state plan. I would like for you to uh, turn your attention to the yellow colored sheet in your education folder. It is the evaluation and data sheet. I would greatly appreciate if you would complete the form at the end, which I will collect. I want you to please be as honest and as frank uh, as possible. Your feedback will not only assist me in making improvements to the information being presented, but it will also allow me to respond to any specific questions or concerns that may not uh, be able to be answered today. The education is broken down into two parts, the problem and the solution. Every problem that we go over gets solved by having an estate plan. And the first part of the education it will be necessary to stay more or less word for word because I don't want you to miss anything in the problem part of the education. This is important. If you have a question, you don't understand something, even if you don't believe something, I want you to write it down and reference the page number. And at the end of the session, we will have some time to answer all questions. But I want you to write it down so you don't forget it, because that will be key. Your internal reaction to the education will determine if you have a need for a state plan. Your level of comfort that you have with me will determine if you feel good about us working together uh, 
with your same God. You will not be able to remember all the things that will or could possibly affect your family. But in the end, you would need to just ask yourself, is it possible that your family could be drastically affected by virtue of you not having an estate plan? What is estate planning? I have something in the packet. I just want to zip through it. Estate planning, my definition anyway, is coordination of a living trust, a will, a power of attorney, health care proxy, a living will, life insurance, death benefit, and any other assets that you own or control. Now, this coordination is done to effectively avoid or drastically reduce the costly and time-consuming process of probate upon death or incapacitation. Also, a means by which to avoid or drastically reduce federal or state estate taxes and gift taxes levied against uh, your taxable estate. Estate planning also lays out concrete instructions as to how you want your assets spent on your behalf during a period of incapacitation that causes you to be incompetent. An effective estate plan determines the legacy and the impact that legacy will have on the lives of those uh, that you love. This is why you're here. This is one of the reasons why I do what I do. Um, it's not my quote. I stole it from somewhere. But uh, it really hit home some years ago when I saw it because it really pertains to what I was doing. You must be shown the problems before you can recognize the importance of the solution. The solution really doesn't mean anything unless you see actually what the problem is. Can everybody in the back hear me? Before you can appreciate the need for a state plan, you have to understand what can happen to you and your family in something called probate court. Now, just about everyone has heard about probate, but most really don't know what it really means until it's too late to do anything about it. What is probate? Probate is the legal process in which your bills are paid and your property is distributed, distributed based upon what your will says if you have one. If you don't have one, it's based upon the laws of the state that you live in. Probate also takes control for those who cannot handle their own affairs because they are incompetent, incapacitated, or they are minor children inheriting property. The court will step in and control their financial and personal affairs while they are not able to take care of themselves. And the court will stay involved or stay in control until the incompetent person either dies or recovers or until the minor child becomes an adult, which in most states is age 18. Probate is the only way to legally transfer title of any title of property, such as real estate, cars, accounts, when the person listed as the owner cannot sign his or her name due to death disability slash incompetency, or because he or she is a minor. So what's wrong with probate? Besides taking a long time, probate is expensive and inflexible. Once the process begins, you and your family lose control and the court takes over. Probate is a complicated legal process that can only go exactly by what the law tells us to do and when the law tells us to do it. Now, with this inflexibility, high cost, and painstakingly slow process, probate can cause all types of unnecessary and unexpected problems for the families that have to go through that process. There are three ways probate can get to you. When you die, if you become incapacitated, or if your minor children, grandchildren, godchildren, whomever they may be, inherit property. There are only two sure ways to avoid probate. Own nothing in your name, not even bank accounts, or you can get what they call a living trust. A living trust is a cornerstone to any effective estate plan. Now there are some common myths about avoiding probate that you may have believed prior to coming to uh, this workshop. I've listed five myths that most people have. 
And this is number one. I have a will, so my family won't have to go through probate when I die. Ladies and gentlemen, that is false. Having a will does not avoid probate. In fact, having a will is a one-way ticket to probate. Here's why. A will can have no effect, absolutely no effect, unless it goes through the probate process. It must be admitted to the probate court to be legal and enforceable. Your will must be validated as being authentic before uh, ownership of your assets can be transferred to your heirs. And the probate court is the only way this could be done. That's the job. So if you have a will and that's all you have, what you're actually telling your family is that I want you to go through probate. Because the only way any of your wishes, and that's all they are, are wishes, can be carried out is that the will has to do probate. Myth number two. My will has a trust in it, so it won't have to go through probate. False again. Many people think that if they have a trust in their will, the trust lets them avoid probate. As I just explained, all wills, even wills that have trust in them, wills that say, I leave this to little Johnny, but I want it held in, in trust, all wills that have trust in them must go through probate, just like any other will. The trust cannot go into effect until after the will has been probated. Myth number three, I don't have a will. So there will be no need for my family to go through probate when I die. False again. Even if you have a written will, the state has written one for you. Every state has laws for the distribution of property distributed according to the laws of that state, which may or may not be the way you would have wanted. Myth number four. I own everything jointly. So when I die, all property will immediately go to the other owner without probate. Maybe, but you have to look out. Joint ownership does not guarantee that you will avoid probate. In fact, it just usually postpones probate. And the postponement is what causes all kinds of unexpected and unwanted problems. And we'll get into that in a second. Myth number five. I have power of attorney. So I don't need a will or joint ownership to avoid probate. False. Some people give power of attorney to a spouse or an adult child, thinking it will allow titles of their property to be transferred without probate when they die or if they become physically or mentally incapacitated. Fact. A regular power of attorney is automatically revoked at death or Incapacity. I'll say that again. A regular power of attorney is automatically revoked at death or incapacity. So it won't be of any use to you. Now, many states, including Maryland, Virginia, D.C., have what they call a durable power of attorney, which remains valid through incapacity, but it too becomes invalid at death. So, in any case, a power of attorney cannot be used. To change title after you die. Joint ownership causes all kinds of unexpected problems. They're unanticipated and unintentional. First, unanticipated. Let's say, for example, you successfully use joint ownership to avoid probate and transfer your share to your surviving spouse when you die. But for some, some reason, that surviving spouse does not add another owner which frequently happens. When your spouse dies, the entire estate, what you left to your spouse, your half, what she or he had at death, must go through probate before ownership can be transferred to the rest of your heirs. So once again, you did not avoid probate, you had it postponed. And because the cost of probate is directly tied to the value of what's going through probate, by virtue of that postponement, now it costs more to take those assets through probate. Next, we call it, I call it unintentional disinheritance. Well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it was unintentional prior to you coming to this class, to this workshop. 
because if you don't know, you don't know. But now, afterwards, you would know. Okay? Remember, if you own property jointly with your spouse and you die first, ownership of that property will go to your spouse when you die. When your spouse dies, the entire property, including your share, will go to your spouse's heirs. That's because when you die, your ownership share automatically transferred to your spouse. So now your spouse owns it outright. Neither you nor your heirs have any incidence of ownership or interest in that property. Now, this may not be a problem if it's the only marriage for both of you that produce children. In this case, your spouse's heirs are also your heirs. But what if you have children from a previous marriage? Unless your spouse has legally adopted them, the children may get nothing because they are not your spouse's heirs. Unfortunately, even if you have a will that says you want your children to inherit your share of jointly owned property, the joint owner, in this case your spouse, will still receive full ownership. That's because joint ownership acts immediately upon the death of one of the owners. So your spouse would own the property outright even before your will could take effect. This means there would not be anything for you to will to your children or to your family. Once again, it was unintentional before you knew. Now you know. There are four types of joint ownership. I'm only going to talk about two the most common. Joint tenancy and tenancy by the entire. Joint tenancy is when each of the parties has an undivided interest in the entire property. So if one person dies, the survivor owns the property. This is referred to as joint tenancy with right of survivorship. The other one I want to talk about is tenancy by the entirety. This type of ownership applies only to legally married couples. Each spouse has an undivided interest in the entire property. On the death of the spouse, the survivor does not get the whole title immediately because the decedent's portion is a part of his or her estate. What's the difference? The details are confusing and a lot of it is meaningless. However, it's been held that tenancy by the entirety is considered a means to protect the property from legal judgments since one of the parties is likely, uh, since one of the owners is likely an innocent party to the legal action. Joint tenancy with right of survivorship is the most common method of holding title because it boasts one powerful feature. It avoids probate. However, when you use any type of joint tenancy, you also create a capital gains problem. Depending on your income tax rate, capital gains may be about 15%. Also, you need to remember that if you put a person on a joint tenant, this is subject to the gift tax on half of the value of that asset. So if you have a $500,000 home, you put a child on your home, you just gave them a $250,000 gift, okay? And you're supposed to report anything over and above $13,000. Failure to declare that gift may mean tax fraud. Let's talk about the myth and the reality, the myth the tax and the tax reality of joint tenancy. Now you have couples or a parent Wanting to avoid probate, they are encouraged to hold real estate in joint ownership. Stocks, bond, investments, and bank accounts are listed in both names. Is this wise? The benefit of survivorship, allowing the other person listed as the owner to get the title without going through probate, is only a minor benefit compared to the problem. I have listed five problems. First one. Since each person owns half of the property, the step up on the property only affects half of the property. The survivor will inherit one half of the fair market value. The result could be a capital gain problem. Let me explain what I mean by the step up. Now I can move over here. Let's say, for example, 40 years ago, a single person purchased a home for $100,000. Okay, 40 years ago. 
Market today, that house is $1 million. You die, you leave it to your children, and they sell it for $1 million. The IRS gives the purchase price a full step up. So in other words, the IRS is acting as though you bought it for $1 million, and now they're selling it for $1 million. So therefore, there is no risk. So, no capital gains tax on the sale of the property. Now, let's change that situation to a couple. Couple purchased a home $100,000 $100, 40 years ago. Market value at that time, today, I'm sorry, $1 million. One spouse dies. The bottom spouse sells that house because it's too big, or it's a small condo, or whatever, for $1 million. The IRS gives the purchase price only a half of a step up. So what that means is they take half the gain, $900,000, which is $450,000, plus the purchase price of $100,000. That equals $550,000. million selling price minus $550,000 step up basis equals $450,000. So you take $450,000, that's taxable. Then you minus everybody's exemption of two hundred and fifty thousand. That leaves you with two hundred thousand of taxable gain. Okay, fifteen percent is thirty thousand dollars. So that's how, with a half of a step up, uh, there very well could be capital gain taxes on the sale. Let me go back to the benefits five. The second problem is if a child is placed. On your deeds or account, there's a very real possibility that a gift tax will be incurred because the portion of the property or the account given exceeds the $13,000 gift limit. That often leaves a tax problem. Third problem, if children are on your deeds or accounts, their debts and legal liabilities can actually lead to the loss of all or part of that asset. Now these liabilities are hard to predict and often found out too late to really do anything about it. Problem number four. A double taxation that can occur comes from the fact that a gift tax may be triggered on the day the gift is made and a capital gains tax will be due at the sale of the asset. Fifth problem, which is my favorite, if children are placed on a deed or an account, the parent may find that they must obtain the permission and signature of the child in order to dispose of or encumber the property in any fashion. Children sometimes believe they know better than the parent on financial decisions later on in life. Let's talk about physical or mental incapacity. You can really end up in a mess if your joint owner becomes physically or mentally incapacitated and can no longer sign his or her name, especially if real estate is involved. You will have to get approval from the probate court before any jointly owned property can be sold or refinanced, even if your co-owner is your spouse. Now, this whole issue of incapacity and the involvement of the probate court is something that's so important but something that very few people actually know about. Remember, any problem that we discuss gets solved by having an estate plan. This is the probate process. Whether or not you have a will when you die, the process to probate your estate is virtually the same. Your family will not be able to change titles on property still listed in your name without a court order, which can only come through the probate court. This includes any title property, bank accounts, real estate, cars, even if you had a will. In most states, an order is required because a will by itself is not enough authority to retitle property or release account balances. First thing that happens is that you die. Your executor, if you name one in your will, has not yet been formally appointed by the court so they can really only take limited action at that point, such as notifying your employer, getting your electric cut off to your house if nobody is staying there, little things like that. Then a petition must be filed. Probate does not automatically happen upon your death. Someone must request that probate proceedings begin. Usually when property needs to be sold, 
Checks need to be written, money withdrawn from the account, or when other assets need to be liquidated or transferred to a new owner. Usually a family member when there is no will, or your executor when there is a will, will request that probate proceedings be given. Now this is a formal process. A written petition, usually prepared by an attorney, is submitted to the court to start the proceedings and will usually include your original will if you have it. A filing fee paid from your assets will be charged to your estate when the petition is presented uh, to the court. Then we have publication. After the petition is filed, in most states, the court will order a formal notice of your death published in the local newspaper for several weeks or a couple of months before the first hearing. Now, this procedure notifies the public of your death and requests that your creditor present any unpaid debts to the court and invites anyone who feels he or she has a right to your estate to come forward and make a claim. The first hearing is usually held six weeks to two months after the filing of the petition. Now, assuming there is no one contesting your will or any other unusual uh, circumstances, the following steps usually occur at this meeting. If you had a will, it must be validated by the court. The judge must make sure that it meets all of the state's legal requirements. Your will is verified that you were in a competent state of mind when your will was drawn up and it has all the proper signatures and witnesses. After the will is validated and admitted into probate court, the court will formally appoint the executor to manage the estate for the court. The executor is not managing the estate for you, the, de the deceased. They are managing it for the court. The executor duties helps the court to inventory your possessions and determine their value. That means what they're actually supposed to do is come into your house and everything that you have, clothes, furniture, china, jewelry, your fur coats, your everything, they are supposed to itemize it and put uh, a price tag on it or a value on it. Why? Because if creditors or anybody has a valid claim that they want to see what you have to liquidate or to sell in order to pay off that debt. At the end of the first hearing, the court will formally open a file on your estate and will usually appoint an attorney to handle the estate paperwork for the court. Of course, all attorney fees are paid from the assets in your estate. Now, during probate, your assets are frozen so an accurate inventory of your property and possessions can be made. This means that your heirs cannot receive their inheritance nor can any property or assets be sold or liquidated without the court's permission. Now, your creditors have a certain number of days uh, from the first publication notice to come forward and submit their claim against your estate for payment. Now, after this time has passed, the executive will audit the claim and present them to the court to get approval to pay them. If there are disputes over a claim, there could be additional hearings at additional costs. When I say costs, that means money coming from your estate with the judge making the final decision as to how it's going to go. Finally, after the court is satisfied that the legal process has been completed, in most cases, at least a year or more, it will usually order another publication to announce the final he hearing to close your estate. At this hearing, the judge will review all the paperwork and order that your debts, claims, taxes, probate expenses paid, including attorney and executive fees, probate fees, any bonds and appraisals, taxes, everything. The cash assets in your estate can be greatly reduced, if not consumed, because of the ongoing expense of probate. If there is not enough cash in your estate to pay your debts, the judge can and will order your property, including your personal belongings, 
sold at a public auction or an estate sale. That's why the executor has to come in and itemize everything that you have. What the probate process does for your family. Before your heirs can receive any part of your estate, all expenses connected with the probate process must be paid. Usually the biggest expense of probate is attorney and executive fees, which can easily run into many thousands of dollars. Some states, like Maryland, have established a guideline to help regulate the fees based on a percentage of the gross value of the estate. We'll get to that. The state of Maryland has guidelines as to the maximum an attorney can charge to take your estate through probate. Whether you have a will or not, it's still the same. Okay? And that regulation or that percentage is 9% of the first 20,000. I'm not talking about cash, I'm talking about whatever the value is. If you have a $200,000 home, First twenty thousand is nine percent, which isn't too bad. That's just eighteen hundred dollars of the first twenty thousand dollars. Then it's three point six percent of everything over twenty thousand dollars. So if you round it off to maybe even four percent, four percent of the value of any house is a lot of money. But that's what the regulations in the state of Maryland, D.C. and Virginia, is, is really about the same. I can't say it's any less. It's really about the same. During probate, your family will not be able to sell property or liquidate assets without court approval, even if they need the money. The probate process, not your family, has control, and your family must try to live their lives within the restrictions of the probate system. Now, probate takes time, and these delays can be extremely frustrating. Remember, the probate system must follow legal procedure exactly, and this process is extremely slow. As I mentioned earlier, probate usually takes anywhere from one to two years, often longer than that. And that's not from the time the person died, that's from the time that somebody got around to filing a petition to start the probate process. Your assets can deteriorate while tied up in probate. Stocks, real estate, and other assets can lose value if they cannot be sold or liquidated uh, in declining markets. No privacy, as you will come to see later on. All probate proceedings are a matter of public record. Forced advertising allows your creditors to present their unpaid bills, but it may also encourage the interest and attention of those who may feel deep down in their heart that they have a right to a part of your estate. It could be devastating to a business owner. Lack of privacy, private financial records, and personal family affairs become public information that anyone can have access to. Your competitors can have valuable inside information courtesy of the probate court. Emotional court. Because it is an ongoing process, probate can be a frequent interruption preventing your family from resuming their own lives and serving as a constant reminder of your absence. It can also cause unpleasant disagreements among family members who would normally turn to one another for support. We're going to go back to if you become physically or mentally incapacitated. Now, most people associate probate with something that happens when you die. Few know that the probate court can take control of your financial and personal affairs before you die by placing your assets or your half of you and your joint owner's assets in something called a guardianship or a conservatorship. Now what this is, is a legal process that was created to protect you and your property if you are unable to take care of your own affairs. Now this is done to prevent someone from taking over your property and squandering your possession. The court will step in, take control, making financial decisions for you and looking after 
your wealth. What's wrong with a conservatorship? Well, most people would prefer that a family member or a friend take care of it, not the court. If you are placed in a conservatorship, the court takes over and your family loses all direct control. Joint ownership. That means if you deal with your spouse disease, that's the death penalty. You now own property together. Joint ownership often causes a guardianship or conservatorship. If you own property jointly, anybody in here that owns property jointly with someone else, spouse, significant other, especially real estate, and one of the joint owners becomes physically or mentally incapacitated that causes them to be incompetent, the other cannot, I repeat, cannot sell or refinance the property without court involvement, even if the joint owner is your spouse. This is because both signatures are required to refinance or transfer the title, and if one of the owners cannot sign his or her name, only the court can sign for that owner. When your state goes into probate after your death, the court must appoint a guardian for your child or children. If you named a guardian in your will, you had a will, the court will usually go along with your choice to raise your child. But it doesn't have to. If you don't have a will, the court will make this decision without knowing what your wishes were. But the court, not the guardian, will keep control of the child's inheritance through the probate guardianship until the child reaches adult age, which in most states is age 18. The guardian may have custody of the child, but the court will control the money that is left for the child. Problems with the children's trust in the will. Some people put a children's trust in their will to prevent the court from taking control of the inheritance. And it really doesn't work the way most people think. And it may not work at all when the child really needs the money. First, because it is a part of your will. The children's trust can't go into effect until after your will is probated. Title assets, which is real estate will have to be probated, and that takes time and money, which is deducted from your estate. It could be a year or more before those assets can get into the child's trust, minus the cost of probate. Let's talk about a probate surprise. Probate is calculated on your gross estate, not your net. That means the value, if, if, if you have a house valued at $300,000 and you got and your neighbor next to you had a house valued at $300,000 but you had a $200,000 mortgage on your house and your neighbor house was, was paid off and y'all both died at the same time y'all both would pay the same probate fee if all things being equal the same probate the court does not take into, consent, into consideration the liabilities or any outstanding debt that you may have. Uh, and once again, your debt and personal liabilities are not, de are not deducted in the calculation of attorney's fees. A person owning a home valued at $500,000 could pay 5% or $25,000 to go through probate. Everyone, with or without a will, goes through probate. They'll charge the same fee. They wait the same length of period to get their estate set. And that would just be for one house. Some of you might, I might be a little too late on this, but special note to divorce and separate parents. If your child's other natural parent is living at the time of your death or at the time of your incapacity, the court will probably appoint them as your child's daughter even though you may have preferred someone else. Fact, guardians, whether it's their biological parent or not, guardians are entitled to be paid for their services from your child's inheritance. I'll say that again. Guardians are entitled to be paid for their services through your child's inheritance. And this may be an incentive for the ex or whomever it is uh, to be interested. 
In addition, if the court does not monitor the guardianship carefully, you run the risk of the ex or that person having access to that money that was intended to be used only for your child's welfare. That gives you a, a, a table of the administrative cost. You have an idea of roughly how much you're worth altogether. Property, other assets, and that gives you an idea of roughly. Okay, could be a little lower, could be a little higher. But remember, just the attorney's fees alone, they say, they can charge 4%. But then you have other probate fees and bonds and appraisals and executive fees and a whole lot of things that could bring it up above 5%. Now, consider these additional costs and problems in probate. If you own real estate in other states, you will be forced to go through probate in each state that you own property in. The cost is to be multiplied since an attorney for that state must also be employed. Fees paid in another court along with other associated courts. Now, if you're lucky enough, perhaps if you had property in Maryland, let's say Prince George's, Montgomery, and also in D.C., chances are that attorney could handle that. But suppose you have property in Arkansas, down in Carolina, you have to go through a whole nother probate process down there. Recent statistics declare that one third of all will contest, that means uh, people that are contesting the will, are successful. Now, this is scary since it's apparently easy to um, void a will by contesting. Let me explain why. Anybody can contest your will. Okay? Public notice. I'm not saying that they're going to win, but anybody can contest your will. The probate is already expensive. It's already taking a long period of time, a year to two years and often longer. That's with no contest. Now, somebody comes out the blue to say this. You owe them such and such. They helped pay your college. They helped buy books, whatever. Don't make a difference. It's up to the estate your estate to prove that that person does not deserve anything. So here's the thing. Even if they don't get anything, your estate still loses because for one, now you have to pay the attorney that much more money to fight these allegations to prove that that person doesn't get anything. And the cost of the, the, the attorney fighting it is astronomical. So what happens is that the estate, the executor, the beneficiaries of the estate, they realize that it's already taking a long time. We, we want to keep this thing rolling. We want this thing to come to an end. What usually happens is that the person who's contesting it, and they're asking for, let's say, I'm asking for $25,000. I think that's what I'm doing. Well, they'll probably accept it. And maybe they say, well, we'll, we'll give you $3,000. Give you $5,000 just to go away. Well, that person didn't deserve anything. But that's how the probate court system uh, uh, gives people an opportunity to freeze your, your, your probate process. And you have to deal with it. You can't just say, look, that's nonsense. I'm not dealing with this. You have to deal with it. That's what the court says. Since little is settled until death, a will is often a prelude to bitter family disputes. Family members remove certain valuables from the family home before others realize what has happened. One or more family members may have signed over property from an aged parent who didn't fully really realize what they were doing. One child who cared for the parent uh, may retain an attorney to get a larger share than allocated to the anger of the other family member. A will is a nine non-binding document. Now, this surprises so many who believe in wills as effective devices for the proper distribution of their estate. It is thought that the judge is bound by the dictates of the will. That is a mistake. A judge is at liberty to what they call set aside a will 
if he or she feels there's a valid reason to do so. A will is only an expression of your desires and not binding on the judge or the court. Now, in the absence of anybody contesting, the will is usually followed without much debate. But whenever a dispute erupts, there is legal complication which causes the judge not to be legally bound by your will and may exercise his or her own judgment. Now, we're going to take a look at the real probate cases, okay? Step away from the mic temporarily, but I think we hit. Remember, I said probate is a matter of public record. What I do is that periodically I go up uh, to Rockville, Old Campus, right there up to the upper Marlboro, and I pull up probate cases just to show individuals that this is what, if you die and you have a will or don't have a will, then your stuff is going to be out there. Anybody can see. Okay? I just hope that there's nobody that you know that. <laughs> okay? Now, this is probate case. You first go in the count. That person is about to start covering the But you can see, this is the inventory sheet. Total 329. That's the total value of the estate. House, everything. Okay? It's usually the first one because we'll talk about the future. The, uh, the house. The, the attorney's fee. That's just six thousand, but that's on a three hundred eighty-six thousand dollar estate. Okay, we got a lot more. This one is three hundred and one thousand estate. Total estate. Attorney's fees five thousand and executive fees twenty five hundred. So that's seventy five hundred dollars. Seventy five hundred dollars on a three hundred and one thousand dollar estate. So I want you to have an idea of what your estate value is. That's your house, your cars, money in the accounts that don't have a specific beneficiary designation, uh, CDs that don't have a specific uh, designation, um, all types of things, okay, that will make up your uh, probatable estate. This one, 314000 Now, these are low estates, okay? The house was 190000 You'll see here, it was 12400 Right here. I want to show you here. You see these? See that? That's Maryland's law. 9% of 20,000, 3.6% of everything over. So you see, that's what it amounts to, and that's what they charge. Now, many times the, the attorneys will do the math, and they won't even round it off. They'll charge it right to the penny. As you can see. Okay? This one is 236,000. 4,736. To the personal representative, and then we have four hundred. Um, we have we have four hundred seven thousand to the uh, to the attorney, and then we have four hundred eight thousand to the personal representative. So you could do the math right. $236,000 estate. Okay? Now we have $287,000. We have, this is, this, is, this is the main one I always like showing. $287,000 estate. Right here, Prince George's County. The attorney's fees were $27,459. But here's the joke. Pointed out right here that the attorney's fees are fair and reasonable. <laughs> That's what they wrote. This is a breakdown. You would, you might want to think, well, 
how do they charge all that much money? Okay, this is three hundred dollars an hour. This is one they charge more than that. But you want to know what they charge for them all. Look at this. Review a file and drafted uh, to accept settlement value in lieu of appraisal for bid rate. That's two point seven hours. At three hundred dollars an hour, that's eight hundred dollars just for talking about accepting a settlement value in lieu of an appraisal for a vehicle that's trying to be sold. Meeting with the personal representative to discuss and pay bills, execute petition, uh, draft the response to auditor's request for additional information. An auditor from the court said we need additional information. So they have to draft something to say why they hadn't got the information to them. That took two and a half hours. What's that, 750? I don't know, my math ain't too good on that thing. Visited the uh, Register of Wills to file a petition, talked to and delivered a letter to auditor, chit chat regarding requested information about inventory. That's one and a half hours. That's 450 hours. Estimated time to complete and close the state, 15 hours. Preparation of fee petition and filing. So that means that they charge the state just to Create this to show you how much they've taken from your state. But here's the kicker. They got $21,000. And still, they asked for out-of-pocket expenses of Now, the same case, you have a uh, personal representative, she wanted 10000 Now that's in conjunction with the attorney for 27000 Okay? Now that's the request. Well, they made her bring it down to 5500 And they gave her that. 5500 This one is for $1,051,000. That shows you how much they could sell. Thirty-nine thousand for the for the Eighteen thousand plus another two thousand, so twenty-one thousand dollars. Okay, okay. This one's two hundred forty-nine thousand. Ten thousand fifty-five dollars. Can y'all see that? I didn't have it. 10,055. There it is. So look, there, there is the uh, formula. Now I consider 20,000 3.6% of everything over. 170,000. Almost 4,000. On a $170,000 payment. $871,000 attorney's fees are $25,000. That's just the attorney's fees, ladies and gentlemen. $551,000. Attorney's fees, $8,012,000. Now, I show you that because a lot of times you could tell the person, you could tell the person, and they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 it's open, it's open. But those are the probate cases from people that died right here in Prince George's County. Okay? Financial and medical guardianship. If a person becomes physically disabled or mentally incapacitated, their personal and financial affairs may be subject to control by a court-appointed guardian. In most states, only the court has the power to appoint a person called a uh, guardian who acts for another person called a ward who the law regards as incapable of managing their own affairs. Once appointed, the court retains jurisdiction for all purposes in connection with all activities of the guardian until the guardian is discharged of his or her responsibility. So that means that once a person becomes a ward, of the state, that means that the state has full control 
And it's very difficult for you to prove that you no longer deserve to be a ward of the state. The living trust alternative. All that we went through already was about the problem. Okay? Now we're about to talk about the solution. Living trust alternative. What is it? And how does it avoid probate? A living trust is a legal document that allows you to transfer ownership of your title property, whether it be home, other real estate, car, checking, savings accounts, investments accounts, and your personal property, whether that be clothes, furniture, jewelry, electronics, tools, etc., from your individual name to something called a trust which you control. Think of it as forming your own company with you yourself as the only boss or you and your spouse together as joint bosses. You personally don't own the property anymore because everything is now owned by your new company, which is your trust. But you still have complete control over everything in your trust. I feel that you have more control over the stuff in your trust than you do with it not being in your trust. I'm not even going to say it's the same control. Reason being is that if it's not in your trust, you have full control while you are competent. But the minute you cross the line of incompetency, I call that you're put to sleep. Because you sleep, you don't know what's going on, you're incompetent. You have no voice. If you had a trust and your assets were in your trust and you became incompetent, now you're asleep. Well, now you have a voice. Your trust is your voice. Your trust says, this is how I want everything to go. This is how I want my money to be spent. This is how much should be spent on a monthly basis. It shouldn't be more than that. If it has to be more than that, then it needs to specifically be for my care. This is who I need you to be accountable to, to make sure that you're spending my money correctly. That's why you have more control with it being in the trust because when you are asleep, when I say sleep, I mean incompetent, you then have a voice because without that, you have no voice. Previously, I said that there are only two ways to avoid probate. Own nothing in your name or have a living trust. A living trust lets you own nothing in your name, yet have complete control over everything in your trust name. Nothing changes except the names on the site. If your name is Mary Beth Smith, and that's the name on your deed, then it would just change to the Mary Beth Smith Living Trust with Mary Beth Smith Trustee. That's the only difference. There's no difference taxation, how you pay your taxes, nothing. It's just that now it is in a trust and all your distribution will come from the provisions that you have laid out in your trust. It's simply a legal technicality which keeps you and your family out of probate. Since you no longer own nothing in your name, there's nothing to probate when you die or if you become mentally incompetent. The reasons why you create a trust is based upon six important decisions. Okay? The cost and delays of probate, the reduction of federal or state estate taxes, the impact of capital gains to the heirs uh, or your surviving spouse, gift tax violations over the $13,000 limit, the problems with disability and guardianship, and the impact of the legacy that you wish to leave. That's important, ladies and gentlemen, as far as, you know, how much effect do you want it to have on their lives? In other words, that you can leave somebody $500,000 and it has no effect. And I can leave them $50,000 and it, the way I leave it changed their life. How does a living trust work? 
First, you the grantor. You set up the trust, you become what is called in legal terms as the grantor. This is the person creating the trust. If you and your spouse are creating the trust together, then you are a co-grantor. Then you need a trustee. This can be anyone you wish, 99.9% .9 of the time, you name yourself as your own trustee. Okay? You're married, you and your spouse, chances are will be co-trustees of your joint trust. This way either of you can automatically act for the other, just like a joint checking account. If one becomes incompetent or dies, the other instantly has control of all trust property with no court involvement. Remember, with the living trust, technically, neither of you owns the property. Your trust does. As co-trustees, each of you have the legal authority to act, manage, and control the trust as the trustee. How is the living trust set up? The state planning advisor prepares your living trust based on your decisions about what you want to happen if you become disabled and when you die. You make the basic planning decisions. You inventory your property, decide who you want to leave it to, uh, name someone you trust to be responsible for its distribution, and someone to take care of you if you can no longer take care of yourself, as well as someone that they would need to be accountable to. Because it's one thing just to have for you to have someone spend your money. It's another thing to have that person who's spending your money accountable to someone else. Don't leave your trust unfunded. You can do all the documents tonight and finish. I mean, not theoretically, but you could. Um, but until you have uh, transferred your property into your trust, it's unfunded. Okay? The only way to completely avoid probate is to retitle everything that you own into your trust. Everything that you can retitle into your trust. Checking accounts, your savings accounts, your, your house, your property, everything, nothing changes. Nothing. However, you want to sell it, it, it doesn't make a difference. Nothing changes. When you sell your property, your name is Mary Beth Smith, and it's in your trust, you just sell it. The owner is Mary Beth Smith, trustee. That's the only difference. Okay? The advantages of a living trust to you and your family. You avoid probate. There is absolutely no probate with a living trust. By avoiding probate, you save thousands of dollars in probate costs. So now instead of a big chunk of uh, your estate going to the probate court, it can go directly to your heads. You keep control. The trust document outlines your instructions for managing your assets, and distributed them after your death or if you become incompetent. So even when you cannot handle your own affairs, you can make sure they are handled exactly the way you want them to be handled. Unless you die or become incompetent, you can sell trust property, change a beneficiary, or even cancel the trust at any time for any reason. You decide the how and when of asset distribution. Now, probate effectively changes ownership to the heirs, so we feel that it is acceptable with its costs and delays. However, a living trust has already settled the issue of ownership because the trust owns all the assets and the acting trustee manages the estate. So when a grantor or both grantors die or become incompetent, Business can go on as usual because a line of successor trustees appointed by you, the grantor, will continue to manage the trust according to your instructions. It takes less time. Distribution of your property when you die can usually be done in just a few weeks, maybe a little longer for larger estates, instead, instead of a year to two years or sometimes more. If you become physically or mentally incapacitated, your backup or successor trustee or your co-trustee immediately takes control for you without court delays or interference. Remember, without a trust, even if you're a husband and wife and one of you becomes incompetent, that 
that that spouse that is competent, they can't do anything without going to court. And what happens then is that when they, let's say for instance, they need to pull money out of the house, you know, for a sickness or to do whatever, they go try to sign the papers. They say, well, my spouse is incompetent. Okay, well, you need the court to approve that. Okay, you go down to the court with all of your spouse's uh, medical information to show just your spouse is sick and why you need to uh, uh, do this refinance or sell a property. Well, what you did is you just opened up a can of worms. And what I mean by that is now the court has to protect your spouse even from you. You heard about the old story, the, you know, the old man, he got old and the, the wife ran off with the, I don't know, tennis instructor or yeah, you know, vice versa. Well, it's, it's really uh, somewhat like that because you can't control, you have no control over your assets or what you do. So what they want to make sure for two reasons, that nobody squanders your assets. The other thing is that because they know eventually, chances are, you're going to come to the state for Medicaid. So they don't want anybody to just squander your money and then put you on the steps of, of the Maryland State Building basically say, if she don't have no more money, you got to take care of it. So that's why they will put you into a guardianship or conservatorship because they also want to make sure that if you have to come to the state for help, that nobody has squandered uh, your money and your assets. And that one. Maintains your privacy. A living trust is private. If you become incompetent, it will remain a private family affair. Do you die? No announcements have to be placed in the paper. No one is invited to contest it. It is not a part of public court records, and I will never have you up here on my bill. No information about your assets or beneficiaries or trustees will ever be made public. A lot of times when you're a beneficiary, they see you a beneficiary, you know, they send in you all types of mail, you know, investments, this and that, because all that's public information, your name, your address, your phone number, all of that is public information, because you have to put that all in the probate file. No information about your assets, beneficiaries, or trustees will ever be made public. It's so private that disgruntled heirs or opportunity seekers who might have contested your will, they may not even know that you have died. Now, a living trust can be contested, okay, but not nearly as easily as a will. Let me explain why. With a will, remember what I said earlier, anyone can come forward and claim to a uh, have a right to a part of your estate without having to hire an attorney. All they have to do is show up. So if it's public, when you're going to have your court date and all that, all you have to do is show up. Yes, I feel that they, they, I'm owed a part of their estate for such and such reasons. Okay? To contest a trust, the left out heir or opportunity seeker must hire a lawyer and file civil suit. Now, since the assets are not frozen under a living trust as they would be in dealing with a will, the trustee can go ahead and distribute the assets to the beneficiary. Now that dissatisfied heir or opportunity seeker then must dig in their pocket and come up with a retainer to pay the attorney and then they have to sue each beneficiary. So in other words, if there was $100,000 and the person was only sued for 5000 and there were 10 beneficiaries each of them got $10,000 a piece. You can't sue one. You have to sue each beneficiary. That's expensive and time consuming. And 99% of the people that if they had to pay for the attorney, they would never sue because they really don't have anything to go with. And they're not going to take money out of their pocket. They just know with the probate, it gives them a platform to stop everything and say, you let it. This, what I'm saying may be ridiculous, but you have to deal with me, whether you like it or not. Probate gives it that platform. Minimizes emotional stress. 
Now, with the court restrictions removed, you and your family or your family can continue their normal day-to-day -day routines much more easily. All of your affairs can be handled quickly and easily. If you are incompetent, your family can look after your care and privacy. When you die, they can grieve your passing privately and get on with their lives without the, fr the frustration of prolonged court proceedings. And it's inexpensive compared to the cost of probate. Now, you will probably pay a little more to set up a living trust than you would to have a will prepared. But don't forget, the true cost of a will also includes the cost of probate. So if you only paid $20 for that will, what did it really cost you if you had to go through probate? So while a living trust may cost more initially, in the long run, it will save your family thousands of dollars. It's low maintenance and easy to change. Setting up your living trust is usually a one-time charge. Once the trust is set up, it requires very little maintenance. You will only need to see your advisor if you make changes to the actual document. If you change a trustee, a backup trustee, a beneficiary, decide to disinherit or reinherit someone, you make these kind of changes to the document, it's usually just a very nominal fee. Okay? You will not need to have your trust changed as you buy and sell property. Sell property, you sign the papers as trustee of your trust. As you acquire new property, you just title it in the name of your trust. So like I said, if you already have a trust, okay, and you're purchasing property, you just purchase it in the name of your trust. Effective prenuptial protection. A living trust also provides very effective prenuptial protection for your property. That's because any property you put into your living trust before you marry remains the property of that trust and stays separate from property accumulated during your marriage, even in community property states. You just have to be careful not to combine assets acquired before and after marriage. Now, it is not uncommon to have three living trusts in one family. Why? Because each spouse may have a separate living trust for property that they acquired before the marriage. And usually you have one for the uh, property that they acquired during their marriage. Final ties. Your family, some of you all feel very strongly about paying your ties. Your family might not be as passionate about distribution to your church as you are. Are there certain ministries that you would like to support or establish in your name? Provisions in your trust can make that a reality and not a pipe dream. Legacy plan. This is so important. This is really asshole. It's important to do your plan. It's not what you give that makes the difference. It's how you give it. See, estate planning means minimizing the taxes, avoiding probate, getting it to who you want to get it to. Legacy planning means how can I you how can I make them use that to have the maximum effect on their lives the way I want them to use. It allows you to decide how the inheritance can or shall be used, whereas it has the greatest impact on the beneficiary's life and not spent on things that have no long-term value or either spent haphazardly. Should some of the inheritance be used for college? Should some of the inheritance be used for a beneficiary's retirement? That's really big now that, that I'm stressing because, um, you know, we all have people in our families that perhaps they didn't do too well in life, and they're struggling. If you gave them X amount of dollars now, it's going to be gone in a year or two. But you know that they don't have no retirement. They don't have nothing in no 401k. So it would be better to say, you know, at least a portion of that, I want to be put in a retirement vehicle for them. So by the time they get to 65, that they'll have had something. And they might not be totally reliant on their sibling or someone else to support them. 
Legacy planning means protecting what you have left to your beneficiaries from their own credit. See, that goes again to it's not what you give, it's how you give it. If you are a parent and you give your child X amount of dollars or X amount of property, and you didn't realize that they had lawsuits of judgment, they owed back child support, back taxes, and all that. Now it's going to, what you left is going to pay that. And that's not what you left it for. But it's because of how you left it, not what you left it. Spending too much too fast. I, I've seen it many a times that a parent or grandparent have caused destruction in that child's life or grandchild's life because they left them with enough money for them to get themselves into trouble. And that became their demise because they spent too much too fast. Lawsuits, judgments, I said, for against the beneficiary, marital divorce. So many people I talk to, they not feeling too cozy about their child's marriage or their grandchild's marriage. And they're, one of their biggest concerns, no, I do not want my daughter-in-law, my son-in-law, or whomever to get anything of what I have left. The thing about it is that it's the way you left. If you outright leave it to, if you have a grandchild, if you have a child, and you leave whatever you leave into that child, it's there. If they're married, it's there. And so what happens if your child dies, before their spouse, now it's going to the spouse. And what's even worse, even if the spouse dies and they had children, or 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 or, or, or the or or let's say they didn't have children or they she had children from a previous marriage, if remember, go back to what I said, if that child is not the spouse's heirs, then they get nothing. That's the unintentional disinheritance. Qualifying for Medicaid, Social Security benefits, dis disability payments, food stamps, or any other federal or state agency benefit. You, you have to be careful when you leave somebody some money and they are receiving any type of federal benefits. It will affect it. Once again, I go back to it's not what you leave, it's how you leave. So with the legacy planning, you have beneficiary trust. We have an asset management trust. That's for minor children, adult children. It doesn't make a difference. The beneficiary trust is for the child or the grandchild that you know they can handle their own money. But you want the protection of knowing that should something happen to them, okay, it's not affected. It's not affected. They can't be sued. If you leave your child something and they driving down the street and they hit somebody and they're sued, if what you gave them is in their name, then it's in their name. And that can be taken from them. And I've seen that many a time. Asset management trust is for the child that you know for sure can't hold on to a dime. And you want to make sure that they don't spend it foolishly. And you lay out the provision under what circumstances. It could be, you know, a monthly stipend. It could be upon emergencies. It could be, there's so many things that we can do to create the, the, the best case scenario for your child. And that's just based on what you express to me and how your feelings are uh, and how much you can, excuse me, you can tell me about that particular situation. We also have a special needs trust. That is for if you have a child or grandchild with disabilities, any kind of disability, and they are receiving uh, 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 federal or state money, okay? You can't leave that child no money because now you will cause them to be disqualified from the benefits that they're getting. And what sense would it make for, for them to be disqualified, then to have to spend the money that you left for their care, and then to try to go back to being on uh, whatever benefits they would get. There's another option, and that's just doing a special needs trust. With a special needs trust, you do not affect their, um, uh, them qualifying for their benefits.
how and when do you want your children uh, to inherit? We kind of just talked about that. Let's skip that. Planning for your living trust. You must make some important decisions. Uh, these decisions will greatly affect the lives of your loved ones. What do you want to happen to you and your assets if you should become incapacitated and lose that? Here's some of the specific things that you need to think about and decide. Who do you want to take care of you? Who do you want to manage your financial affairs? You can go down the line because I'm not going to read that. Okay? But you can read that at your leisure. Who will be your trustee? As I mentioned earlier, 99% of the time, we pick our own selves as our trustee. If we are married, then we're co-trustee. But the most important thing is that you get to choose your backup or successor trustee. And then you spell out the provisions as to how you want your money spent. Now, first I'm talking about incapacitation. When you're asleep, okay, and you don't know what's going on, you want to lay out specifics as to how it should be, uh, how your money should be spent. And most importantly, if you are a parent and you have several children, you need to lay out which one you want to handle the money. Now, some people say, oh, I got two children, I have three children. Look, just pick one. Now, you can make that one accountable to the others so they are still all in the loop. But you have to pick one because if you don't pick one, it's always a possibility of a disagreement. If there's a disagreement amongst co-trustees, then you are right there in court. And that's why you did the trust or the estate plan in the first place, just to stay out of court. If you have minor children, your living trust should contain provisions for a children's trust or create a separate trust to prevent the probate court from taking control of the inheritance. Medical and financial directive. If your health deteriorates and you become unable to make financial or medical decisions, another adult must have legal authority to make these decisions for you. Next of kin is not the same as having legal authority. I'll say that again. Next of kin is not the same as having legal authority. Now there are two ways that you can deal with this possibility. One, you can do nothing. If you don't make any arrangements in advance, a judge will probably appoint someone, a conservator or a guardian to make decisions for you. These court proceedings for incapacitated and competent persons are costly. When I say they're costly, they come from your pocket. You will sleep, you don't know what's going on, but your accounts are being tapped because you must pay for this process. If you suffer a medical emergency and not be able to make decisions for yourself due to the incapacitation without having documents prepared, giving someone other than yourself the legal authority to make decisions for you, your family will probably have to file a petition to the probate court, which is very costly, to be granted permission to make certain important decisions in regard to your health care and the manner in which your money is to be spent. Or you can create legal, medical, and financial authorizing documents to provide binding instructions concerning your health care, life-sustaining, medical technology, and other types of treatment. Now, with a durable power of attorney for finances, you can authorize someone to manage your financial affairs and specify any limits or directives as to how your money or property should be handled. Now, even if you plan to place all of your property in your living trust, a power of attorney, a durable power of attorney, that is, is still necessary because if you are incapacitated, you are likely to be eligible for long-term disability, a workman's compensation, disability SSI, social security, pensions, or money from your own retirement program, and the only person that you grant legal authority to can have access to these funds without having to go through a long and painful process of probate court. Federal state taxes. If there's anybody in here who, when you tally up everything that you own, including your retirement, including your life insurance, including everything, 
gets over five million dollars. Okay. The first dollar over five million dollars gets taxed at thirty-five percent. Now, there's a good chance that only half of us have at least five million dollars. Okay, so I'm talking to the other half. That's for federal. For state, it's just a million dollars. That's what your life insurance, the value of your house, your savings, your retirement, your pension, your cars, your fine art, everything. The first dollar over one million dollars is taxed at 16%. And I think I did mention life insurance. But that's the, that's the biggest thing that's overlooked in tallying up uh, uh, your total taxable estate. To determine the current size of your net estate, you have to add up the current market value of everything you own and subtract any debts that you may have. Okay? Also, it, uh, once again, rather, it includes life insurance benefits, retirement 401k, pension, everything you have to tally up. The marital deduction. Now, you may not know it, but you may have already had a plan, if you're married, to reduce estate taxes. That means that if you have a spouse, when you die, you can leave just about everything. You know, when they changed the, the tax situation, I think they made it maybe about $10 million or so that you can leave your spouse. Okay? Most of us, that, that doesn't affect us. Okay? But the problem is that for the, for, the, for the smaller states, let's say above a million, two million, that two people, both of you have exemptions. What happens if you're a husband and a wife, and let's say your husband dies first, he leaves everything to his spouse. He didn't use his exemption. He forfeited his exemption. So now what happens is that when the, when the, when the wife dies, all she only has is a $1 million exemption. Let me show you how that affects. You see there with the will, this is assuming that there's a $2 million uh, estate. That's with life insurance and retirement and okay? There's no estate taxes and no probate because everything is owned jointly. Spouse owns, spouse owns everything, $2 million living on his estate value, $2 million. The, the state estate tax on a $2 million estate is $160,000. The probate fees are $100,000, roughly at five. So the children's inheritance went from $2 million to $1.740 That's a shrinkage of $260,000, all because there was not what they call an AD trust. Now, let's look at the AD trust provision. Same $2 million estate. But it's in a joint AD living trust. When the first spouse dies, that one trust splits into two. Each spouse gets $1 million. Now, that doesn't mean that this trust here belongs to the deceased spouse. Okay? That trust belongs to the surviving spouse. This trust, the surviving spouse, can take the principal for health, maintenance, support, or education. So those three, those four reasons, then he, can take, he or she can take 5% of the principal or $5,000, whichever is greater, every year for any reason. So what it is is that when you die, the deceased spouse has to say, out of the two million that we have together, this is mine, but my spouse can use it. But I have to say this is mine, so I can get my exemption. Okay? So now what happens when the surviving spouse dies, a full one million from the surviving spouse goes to the state, and a full one million from the first to die goes to the state. No estate tax, no probate fee. Now the children get the full two million. So that two a two million dollars estate. It's two hundred and sixty thousand dollars greater. 
just from an AB living trust. Additional tax planning with irrevocable options. What that means is that if you have, let's say if you're a single person and your uh, property is worth $1 million, okay, but you have $500,000 in life insurance. So now your total estate value is $1.5 million. So 16% of the $500,000 has to go to state estate tax. What do you do? You do an irrevocable life insurance trust. That same $500,000 of life insurance that you have, you create an irrevocable life insurance trust and you put that policy in your trust. And that type of trust. The pros of this type of trust is that now that $500,000 is not included in your estate. So now you don't have to worry about paying the state estate tax. The drawback to that is that, remember I said it's irrevocable. Once you set it up, you can't change it. That is the drawback. But most of the time, later on in life, when you have a life insurance policy, you kind of know, especially if it's your child or what, what have you, you know the chances are that's not going to change. But it is irrevocable. And there's certain other things that you have to do to keep it out of your estate. That means that you can't have no incidents of ownership. You can't change the beneficiary. You can't do nothing. Once you set it up, it has to stay that way. The benefits of a living trust. This is kind of just recapping everything. An effective estate plan addresses many areas of concern that could deplete, erode, or cause catastrophic problems that will be avoided by creating and implementing your estate plan. The living trust, what does it do? It avoids probate, it lays out specific and creative instructions for the distribution of a person's assets that has the most profound effect on the lives of your beneficiary. Lays out specific cash management instructions if a person becomes disabled or incompetent, appoints your management person as well as his or her backup, establishes alternate beneficiaries. This is extremely important because if you leave something for somebody and they die before you and you don't change your thing, you need to decide who's going to be the alternate. Or even if they do survive you, but they don't, they don't get to use it all up, who gets the remainder of it? That's what you have to decide, or you should be in a position to decide. Drastically reduces the possibility of beneficiaries or non-beneficiaries contesting your distribution instructions. Establishes a check and balance system. Eliminates capital gains tax. Capital gains tax, tax. Appoints the person who shall serve as your physical guardian. That's extremely important as well. You may have three or four children, but you need to appoint one that will serve as your physical guardian. And then you if you have three children, the second one will be the backup to them. The third one will be the backup to them. So you're not totally taking them out of the loop. Then we have ancillary documents. We've been talking about the trust, okay? But you have ancillary documents that go with your trust. Yes, everything needs to be in your trust, but you still need a will, a backup will. We call this a pour-over will. The reason why we call it a pour-over will basically is what you're saying is that my intent was to leave everything in my trust. But if there was something that I left out or forgot to put in or it came into existence when I was incompetent and it just never got in my trust and it has to go through probate, once it goes through probate, I do not want it distributed. I want it to be poured back into my trust and distributed based on what my trust provision Okay? So your, your pour-over will becomes your backup that if there's something, things that you forgot or you never got the opportunity to put it in your trust, it will eventually get in your trust after it goes through probate. Power of attorney. Everything is not in your trust. There's certain things, you know, you have your pension, your social security, and handling your business, your taxes, it could be a lawsuit, it could be anything. 
You need someone to have the authority to speak for you when you cannot speak for yourself due to the incapacitation or incompetence. Then we have the power of attorney for health care. You need someone that's going to make the health care decisions while you are hospitalized when you can't make them for yourself. Once again, you can have two, three, four children. You need to have one Indian in charge. Now, maybe they may have to consult with the other, but you need one head Indian, one chief, because if not, it's going to be a whole lot of problems. Okay? And last but not least, we have the living will. Few of us want to be held on life support when the chance of survival is gone. Okay? If you are on life support and there's, you know, there's no chance of you making it, here's the thing. Some people feel like, you know what? I need you to give me some more time because I might get pulled out of this. But now, if your children, if they come to the children and they say, well, look, you know, no hope, whatever, whatever, they may say, okay, pull the plug now. I don't want her to suffer, I don't want him to suffer, so forth and so forth. But now, suppose there is a disagreement. One child says, that wouldn't want her to live like this, she wouldn't want to be like this. The other child says, no, there's still some things we may can do, we haven't tried everything, now we've got problems. Well, that decision was up to you while you're here, if you choose to make it. I give it 30 days. I give it 14 days. After, 14 days after the doctor said there's nothing we can do. Not 14 days of me being on life support, but 14 days after the doctor said there's absolutely nothing we can do. Whether it's 30 days, whether it's 5 days, whether it's 90 days, I've had so many days. So that's a personal decision. Somebody asked me, Sean, what do you think? How many days? What's the going rate or the average? There is none. That's just a personal decision. You know, and, and it's always different. That same person can make a, a, a decision a certain amount of days and then change that when they experience someone on life support. Okay? Then we have guardianship for minor children. Okay? That's important. Who's going to raise your children? Okay, a lot of times, especially with single parents, they say, yes, I had this child, and I'm just being quite frank, had this child, father's really not that much in his life, or not really responsible, yeah, it's great if we were together, but we're not together, and just leaving the child outright with them, no, I don't want to do that. Well, if you don't lay it out, why you would want somebody else to raise the child? And, you know, and why, the chances are that's where the child is going to go. And it may just be just for the money because if you're a single parent, another problem is that most of the single parents, they have their minor children as the beneficiaries of everything that they own. So now you've got the ex once again going back to remember the guardian can be paid for their services if your child inherits. It might be in a court control guardianship, but the guardian is now like, look, I need money for this, I need money for that. Okay? What cannot what cannot be cured is delay, i.e. procrastination. Far too often, courts inherit cases where no planning was done and the judge has sole authority in making decisions that affect, that affect the very personal lives of your family. And the thing is that those were your decisions to make. This is the big question. That's why we were here. Do you have a need for state plan? Now the answer to that question should be heartfelt. If you are incompetent, how do you dictate who will manage your finances according to your exact instructions? What type of legacy do you want to leave to your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or any other loved ones? How do we structure that legacy that it has the most positive impact and guidance on their lives and not be wasted on things that have no long-lasting effect on their quality of life? 
your state plan can and should make a difference as to the person or persons you hope that they will become.